Hello, everyone. Hey, hello, everyone. Welcome to this solar session. I'm the chair of this session. My name is Julie Chen. I'm from Carnegie Mellon University. And then today we're going to have three presenters. Um, and the first one is Jonah. And I have a little introduction uh, of Jonah. So Jonah Green is a research scientist at Colorado State University in the Department of Mechanical Engineering working with Dr. Jason Quinn. The majority of Jonah's work is focused on the te techno technical, <laughs> sorry, techno economic analysis and life cycle assessment of algal uh, <laughs> cultivation and con conservation systems. However, however, Jonah has con conducted sustainability analyses for many different renewable energy concepts, including integrated micro utility grids, uh, anaero anaerobic, anaerobic um, digesters, uh, algae based inks, algae. algae. Algae-based link yeah. inks, inks, sorry, and mice timber construction. And then you may tell that I'm not, I'm definitely not an expert in all those areas. So yeah. I'm going to go to do you, John. Awesome. Thank you so much for that introduction. Uh, let me get my screen shared up here. We'll dive right in. Thanks for that introduction, Julie. And uh, thank you to everyone that's listening to this talk. I'm looking forward to getting your feedback and thoughts on this presentation. So, uh, as Julie mentioned, I'm with Colorado State University, and today I'm going to talk about uh, kind of a separate side analysis that we've been working on uh, for a net zero kind of carbon building concept that's sort of a case study and also a, a planned building that will be constructed on the Colorado State University uh, campus. So just to give a few quick acknowledge acknowledgments, I'd like to thank Nina and Architruction. They've been a partner on the project and have provided a lot of really great insight and materials lists in terms of these two different building designs. And I'd like to thank Jason Quinn and the rest of the Quinn Lab Group at, uh, at the Energy Campus. So a little bit of background on the existing Powerhouse Energy Campus. It's a building that was constructed on campus uh, back in 2014. Um, there was a lot of energy efficiency goals involved in this building and it did certify for a LEED Platinum certification. Uh, there's just a number of reasons that it's uh, energy efficient, including solar arrays. It has a cooling tower, radiant slab heating and cooling. Um, there's like there's like little wind turbines where the old uh, coal stacks used to be. Uh, and then just other things like fiberglass windows and special glazing on those windows and some exterior insulation. And so the goal in constructing this building was to be an example in moving forward towards energy efficiency. And so now they want to construct another addition, a standalone addition to that, to the powerhouse, and we'll get fancy and call it Powerhouse 2. And that's going to be uh, just across the street here in Fort Collins, Colorado. And so the guy in charge of all this, he's an author on this presentation. His name is Brian Wilson. He has a lot of vision for this project, um, but one of the main ones he's focused on has been this mass timber construction. And so that is using cross laminated timber or CLT as I'll refer to it throughout the presentation to replace most of the structural concrete and then glue lamb beams uh, to replace a lot of the structure, structural steel. And the difference between those two is just how it sounds. Cross, lam cross laminated timber has two directions of timber um, and the glue lamb is all unidirectional and it's all glued together. Um, addition to the mass timber construction, he's looking at doing a ground source heat pump to reduce some of the natural gas load in this building, and then also looking at including a larger solar array, uh, potentially covering the entire roof and, and maybe even expanding past that to cover a parking structure or be in the adjacent field there. So the point of this analysis and this presentation is to kind of answer the question, can we achieve net zero embodied carbon just using this mass timber construction? And then if this is not possible, how can we get there when we kind of expand and consider the entire life of the building? And so for this study, uh, the approach I took was to, first of all, work very closely with Neen and Architruction. Um, they've been awesome in providing a really detailed materials lists for both of these building designs. And so the buildings are functionally uh, equivalent. They'll, have, they'll house the same office spaces and laboratories. Um, it's on the same site in Fort Collins. Uh, everything is, is the same except for the structural design. And so the steel and concrete design is optimized for those materials and the mass timber design has been optimized for the mass timber to you know, minimize waste and make sure that the spanning of the building and everything is, is to the manufacturer's recommendation. 
Um, once I had materials list from Neenan, the next step was to get lifecycle inventory data. Um, used a number of different sources on this, including EcoInvent mainly, but then a lot of other specific literature studies for each of these different building materials. For example, the insulation is, is kind of tough to find on EcoInvent, but very easy to find. The manufacturer has done their own life cycle assessment of that product. Uh, for building operational emissions, it's I've used a combination of existing uh, utility data for the Powerhouse Energy Campus and then to supplement where that data was kind of not a great estimate using IECC building models. To estimate rooftop and auxiliary solar production, I've used the NREL PV Watts tool. And then kind of factoring all these things in together, we're looking at net lifetime carbon emissions uh, for both building designs. And then we've kind of played around with sizing this solar array in a way that we could offset operational emissions and achieve a net zero carbon building over uh, various different time horizons. LCA methodology, a lot of you here, most of you here, very familiar with this, so I won't spend a whole lot of time here, but obviously based in the system engineering model, um, looking at mass and energy, followed by a very thorough life cycle inventory data search. And for this analysis, we're really just doing a global warming potential analysis and really only concerned really with CO2, CH4, and N2O emissions associated with these different uh, material inputs. And then uh, determining emissions avoided, so system credits and also energy production and material recycling scenarios, and then kind of allocating burdens and looking at system boundaries. And then, and then I guess that really, that, that's the life cycle assessment there. And so we're doing that consistent with the ISO uh, 14040 standards. And then of course, uh, looking at global warming potential, we're considering our impact factors for our different greenhouse gases. And the functional unit that we're interested in for this study has, has been de declared as kilogram CO2 equivalents per meter squared of building area. Uh, but results you'll also see in this pre presentation just in, in total uh, total amount of CO2 in tons of CO2 equivalents. As far as system boundaries, we kind of took two different approaches. Uh, the first phase of the study, we really looked at this embodied carbon analysis or just kind of the cradle to site system boundary, uh, really only considering raw material extraction, um, the production of those materials, and then getting them to that construction site. But then it became cl very clear that uh, it was really important to expand our analysis and go all the way through cradle to grave, considering building construction, uh, operational emissions, which includes that solar energy production and then selling to the grid and pulling from the grid as, as well. Um, and then building deconstruction. And then we did spend quite a lot of time and effort looking at different end of life phases for that material disposal and recycle box right there. So to talk a little bit about building materials for the two designs, uh, in the top right, there's a picture of, of what the basic building will look like. That is the, the timber version, uh, but the steel version is basically the same, same footprint and structure and everything. Um, and so in terms of building material quantities, uh, I've got just the, the raw mass quantities here for both buildings. The blue is the steel building, the green is the mass timber building. And so you can see that fill material is the the largest mass involved in this construction um, following that you've got concrete asphalt uh, and then structural steel and timber being the other major mass components there and so you see here that uh, the timber building still requires a fair amount of concrete but it is a pretty large reduction and then the timber building is pretty much completely eliminated that structural steel requirement it does still need some of that medium strength low strength steel uh, which we've called in this analysis, the merchant bar. And then um, obviously the steel building doesn't have any mass timber products. And we did consider transportation distances for these different, uh, for these different materials, um, because obviously that's gonna make a big difference in, in the case of the timber, especially, we'll, and you'll see that later in, the, in more of the results. In terms of building construction and deconstruction, energy and emissions, we, really just based this estimation on crane diesel consumption. And we used an equation from the Athena Sustainable Materials Institute, it's shown on the screen there, um, but really just estimating our total diesel fuel consumption to lift these materials, the average height that they'll be lifted, um, half the building height was, was taken as the average. And then uh, this was mainly all we really did for construction. For deconstruction, we were careful to consider like, 
most buildings are taken down with a wrecking ball. And so deconstruction emissions might, might be lower than this. They don't really require a crane to like pick it apart, but some of our end of life scenarios did involve actually just reusing the mass timber members. And so in those scenarios, we were careful to say that deconstruction would be as much or more than construction because you actually have to pick, pick the building apart in order to reuse those materials again and give them a second life. For building operational energy, this was based mostly on energy, uh, the existing powerhouse energy campus utility data, uh, especially the electric consumption. It was compared against the IECC building models, uh, just, just to have a second reference, and it, and it did turn out to be a little bit lower than the IECC models, but that's expected uh, just because of all those improvements it has in terms of operational energy and being LEED Platinum certified. Um, but the existing powerhouse houses some really enormous uh, natural gas research engines. And so the standalone addition is not expected to house those. And so we needed just an estimate of kind of typical natural gas consumption. And then we did want to convert that natural gas load for heating uh, into an electric load uh, for a ground source heat pump. And so I actually had some help from Ben, who's going to present after me today, doing these calculations and working this into our analysis. And so that load for the for the heat pump was added to our total electric load. And then we did still uh, include a natural gas load for water heating in the building. For the rooftop and auxiliary solar production, we really just assumed that the entire roof would be covered. And then we used the NREL PV Watts calculator to kind of estimate what our production might be at that specific site, given the weather trends in Fort Collins, Colorado. And there were a number of other solar system assumptions. We assumed a single axis tracking system. We added a 0.8% panel, panel degradation factor uh, every year, just to kind of be more conservative on the estimation side for solar production. Um, and then we kind of took our average on-site production and used that value when sizing the auxiliary solar array. So the end of life scenarios that we consider, considered, um, we looked at three different scenarios and these were kind of based on discussions with um, people in the industry as well as some of the experts that have done a lot of the LCA work for mass timber so far. And it, and it seems that kind of the business as usual case is scenario three where a lot of or most of the wood gets sent to the landfill. A portion may be incinerated for um, energy generation and things like that, but it does seem like that is the business as usual case. And so we've included that as scenario three, but we wanted to look at two others to kind of represent what might happen um, in the future as uh, sustainability targets becoming more, more important and people want to reduce their carbon footprint. And so the first scenario we looked at was a direct reuse slash particle board scenario. And so for this, we took our CLT panels and our glue lamp beams and we made some assumptions here. We said that 75% of our CLT panels could be pulled out of the building and reused in a new construction with that remaining 25% being processed into particle board. And for the glue lamp beam, since you really only have to chop off the very end where the steel connection is, we assume that you could reuse 95% of that glue lamp beam. And reuse of glue lamp beams actually has been proven to work and it's been done in the Pacific Northwest before. Um, and so the remaining 5% of that uh, scenario also would be processed into particle board. For our second end of life scenario, we just assumed that both CLT panels and glue lamp beams, 95% uh, of that total mass would be turned into particle board and the remaining 5% we would send to the landfill. And once in the landfill, we determined emissions based on a study from uh, Lee in 2017 um, who really looked at carbon fate of different products that enter the landfill. And so this is for wood. Uh, it's kind of a, an updated adjusted value. That's what we used from their study. Um, and so even though a large portion of it is sequestered, uh, nearly 80%, uh, the other 20% is released in sometimes worse forms than CO2, right? So we have decomposition of, of biomass and emissions of methane, which uh, we all know are, you know, 28 to 34 whatever number you choose to pick for your study, that much worse than CO2. Um, and then scenario three, as I mentioned, business as usual, 100% going to the landfill. And this was more to just have a comparison uh, in the end of life of these different scenarios. So the results I'll start with are the embodied carbon of the building. On the right, I have embodied carbon uh, separated by both material and 
which building design you're looking at. So blue is the, is the steel building, green is the timber building. And then I'm just gonna pull materials from this and add them to our total on the left here and kind of talk through it. And so first thing is our fill material and asphalt. Um, that's the same for both buildings. The grading is the same for both designs on the side and, and all of that. So no change there. Uh, when we get into concrete, obviously the steel concrete building has a little bit more uh, concrete involved in the construction. The masonry, the stone and brick veneer is really just uh, kind of the outer shell of the building and that's the same for both designs. Here's where we see a huge difference, right? This is structural steel. So the large uh, darker brown bar on the left here, that's that's your structural, st structural steel. And we're really saving a lot in embodied emissions by not using that. And not only that, but we're adding a huge negative credit for this biogenic carbon that's embodied in the mass timber products. Um, and so that's those negative purple bars there. And then we've kind of got the rest of our materials, um, gypsum drywall board, insulation, fiberglass windows, all of that stuff. And then last but not least, uh, transportation. And so transportation is shown with the hatched hatch boxes. And uh, this is clearly a pretty significant uh, addition in the body embodied carbon, especially for the timber building, you can see that transporting those beams from the Northwest does have a significant impact on the total embodied carbon of the building. So looking at our net values, we see a huge reduction in the mass timber building compared to the steel building, um, an 85, 88, 85 to 88% reduction there. Uh, I'd like to talk about end of life emissions as well. So if you forgot what the scenarios are there in that table in the bottom right, um, but we'll kind of walk through these as well. So. On the far left there is the steel and concrete building. Um, the large negative green box is because steel and steel is very recyclable material, it can be reused and most structural steel is sourced from recycled steel anyway. Um, we've got our three mass timber cases to the right of that. We've got landfill, particle board, and the reuse scenario. And so I wanna just highlight these lighter green boxes here on the particle board and reuse scenarios. So this, uh, this is what we're gonna call the landfill avoidance credit. And so by expending the emissions to turn this into particle board or transporting it to a new construction site, um, we're avoiding the business as usual case of the, of the mass timber going to the landfill and having a portion breaking down into methane. So we're avoiding those emissions, those emissions and that's being awarded to this scenario as a credit. Um, in the in the LCA. And so obviously has a large impact on our net values here. And I want to point out that the steel concrete scenario for end of life emissions is better than two out of three of the mass timber scenarios. Um, but the reuse scenario for mass timber uh, is obviously the best, the best choice moving forward um, for mass timber. And not only because of the end of life emissions, but just because of the carbon fate and what's actually being sequestered. And so I want to walk through that calculation now. Um, I've got the same thing here, basically our landfill particle board and reuse scenarios along the bottom there. And I've just broken this into the CLT and the glue lamb because we've made different assumptions on how much of each of those products can actually be reused. Um, and so to start, we've got this biogenic carbon, this embodied carbon in the mass timber products. It's obviously a huge amount of embodied carbon and a lot of mass going into that building design. Um, but we do have to count the not only the forestry operations and the lumber production and transportation, but also the manufacturing process itself of making both the CLT and the glue limb. It's a lot of wood to dry. Um, and it's also a lot of mass to transport. And so those emissions are very important and included here in our analysis. Um, for the landfill and the particle board scenario, which has a small fraction of the wood going to the landfill, we have these emissions, uh, not only from transporting to the landfill, but once in the landfill, we have non-collected CH4 emissions, oxidized CO2 emissions, collected and combusted CH4 emissions, which um, are emitted as CO2 and then CO2 from waste decomposition happening. Um, and so those are shown with kind of the brown and yellow bars there. And then we wanted to include uh, emissions associated with transporting the mass timber from the existing construction site, uh, either to a new construction site or to a new process, to a processing facility where it can get turned into this particle board product. 
uh, to have another second life. And so that's shown with the purple bars here. And so when you add all this up and you look at the carbon fate uh, on the right, secondary y-axis, we have our percentage of carbon actually sequestered for these different scenarios. And so you can see in the landfill scenario, only about 10% of that embodied carbon is actually sequestered when you look at it through the end of life phase. Whereas in our reuse scenario, we're achieving closer to 50 or 60% of that biogenic carbon staying sequestered through the end of life of the building. We also wanted to look at the size of the solar array that we would need to achieve a net zero carbon building over different time horizons. So we started with a 30 year building, which is pretty conservative uh, given how uh, sturdy construction is now, but that's what we wanted to start with. And um, you can see here that the size of the solar array is not that different between the buildings. It is, um, you know, quite a big difference between like the timber building reuse scenario and the steel and concrete building. But in the grand scheme of things, uh, those are giant solar arrays in both cases to have on a, on a typical building. Um, and so the takeaway here is that operational emissions are trumping everything in terms of when you look at cradle to grave of this building. Um, and also you have a lot of embodied carbon up front, but for most of the scenarios we looked at, you have um, a big credit at the end of life for this recycling potential. And so those tend to sometimes cancel out and then still biggest thing and most important thing is operational emissions. And so that being said, um, we've got our rooftop solar array for all these scenarios, which is the same size. And then the auxiliary array is shown in the yellow bar here. Um, but that being said, you know, we expanded this out to 40 and 50 years to see if it made a huge difference. And it really didn't. Um, just kind of reinforcing that fact that operational emissions are, are the, uh, the big dog in this game. Here's another way just to look at at that graph from before. This is uh, the x-axis is years from one to 30. Um, y-axis is tons of CO2 equivalents emitted per year. So you have a large emission in year one for the embodied carbon. And then you slowly year by year produce a little bit more energy than you consume to pay back that carbon um, and reach net zero by year 30. What's interesting is that like the timber building, the green line there, um, there's such a large emission in the landfill that you have to go carbon negative by year 10 uh, in order to achieve that net zero carbon uh, by year 30. And so um, we also wanted to show what this looks like for 40 and 50 year analyses. Um, and obviously the shapes are pretty much the same. There's this kind of kink in year 30 here for these analyses. And that's uh, from the assumption that you have to replace your solar array after 30 years. And so basically after you're 30, you're just paying that back. Um, and so if I go back here, you can see that the timber reuse case for 40 years actually has a bigger solar array than the timber reuse case for 30 years. Um, and that's because you have really only 10 years, you know, to 10 extra years to pay off a whole additional solar array. We did do sensitivity analysis as well, uh, mostly on our LCI data, just to you know see uh, the importance of that and the changes that may occur in the results of our study. And so, for the steel and concrete building, you know the biggest change we saw was about 10% in uh, total embodied emissions uh, from changing the LCI data on the steel by plus or minus 20%. Uh, conversely, we kind of had a larger change in the mass timber uh, design, you know, reaching 50% change in total embodied carbon when we're changing our LCI data for our CLT and our glue lamb. And so that's really just highlighted the importance of having really good LCI data for those sources. And, and I'm pretty confident in the studies that we went with. They're very, very thorough um, and, and really good work out of the Pacific Northwest um, looking, at, looking at these processes in detail. And so um, I think the biggest question here is whether or not you count that biogenic carbon uh, and what that means to the analysis. And that's, that's something that we'd like to look at moving forward. Also, we did just wanted to show kind of a quick comparison to other studies. And for both building designs, we're coming out kind of low on the embodied carbon side. And there's a number of reasons for that, I think. Um, first and foremost, I think that these building designs have been extremely optimized for, for both different types of construction. Both the steel and concrete building is, is trying to minimize mass and cost, and so is the mass timber building. And these are these are 
you know, cutting edge designs coming straight from Neenan Architecture. Um, and then really they've maximized the use of mass timber products. So trying to substitute wherever they uh, could uh, structurally afford to. And then also trying to minimize waste in their construction process. And then aside from that, just kind of having simplicity in their design and architecture. They don't have any curved sections in this building. There's not gonna be a lot of waste from getting fancy and doing that. And the other main thing that I would like to point out as a limitation in the study is that we don't have, in the results that you, you've seen today, we don't have uh, fasteners included in either building design. And so that is expected to add a significant chunk of embodied emissions as well. And we are planning to add that. We just haven't gotten that, uh, that data yet. So some quick conclusions from the work. Um, the transportation of the mass timber products seems to be kind of the difference between uh, this net zero carbon and net positive embodied carbon. And so that is a really important factor, um, especially as people can, are considering um, implementing more mass timber construction. The farther you get away from the Pacific Northwest, where most, most of this mass timber comes from, the larger uh, transportation emissions you have. And so the further you get away from being able to claim, you know, this net zero carbon. Uh, another conclusion is that the reuse of these mass timber products is really essential for um, carbon sequestration, right? We're getting 50 to 60% of that embodied carbon actually staying sequestered uh, when we reuse or, or repurpose these products versus 10% uh, of that carbon being sequestered when we, when we landfill these products. And then from a cradle to grave perspective, um, you know, with the size of that solar array over the different time periods, um, Really, the takeaway message here is that energy efficiency in building operation is where the priority of effort should be focused, right? I, I mean, reducing embodied carbon is absolutely good, and using building materials that do embody carbon, it absolutely can't hurt. But in the grand scheme of things, energy efficiency is going to be the kicker. And then also wanted to point out that steel has a high global warming potential, but is also extremely recyclable. Um, and so this should definitely be considered. And then another finding kind of from our study is that construction and deconstruction emissions in the grand scheme of things in the full cradle to grave the system boundary seem to be pretty negligible or, or just very small compared to everything else. And so I really look forward to anyone's feedback. Please send me an email if you saw anything here that um, stuck out as being profoundly wrong. <laughs> I would love the, the input and the feedback. We want to make this the best study that we can. Um, and with that, I'm very excited to answer anyone's questions. Thank you very much for your presentation. And then it looks like we have time for one or two questions, um, two quick ones maybe. And any people from the audience, you can either uh, click the ask button or join the podium or um, you know type your question in chat either way. Um, well, I, I know nothing about algae algae, right? <laughs> but uh, I do know something about LCA. So um, uh, I have a question for like, I guess, more like, a, um, you know, follow up of the what you presented. So what impact method do you use to estimate a global warming potential? Uh, we're using the the Tracy method okay. uh, in eco. Um, I see, because uh, um, based on my, you know, well, my research is part of understanding uncertainty using all these methods, so it, it can make a big difference if you choose different type of methods. So maybe mm -hmm. take a look, maybe it's it going to uh, surprise you. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, any other questions from the audience? Um, well, I guess. Uh, maybe you have one here. Someone's joining. Hello. Hey. Hello. Hi. Yes. Um, great presentation. I, I was very interested in, in uh, some of the finding from your analysis. Um, out of curiosity, one quick thing. Um, did you think about how the removal of carbon from the forest will affect the conclusion? What I mean is, for example, when we do harvest, we remove a significant amount of the carbon store, and maybe it will take 30 or 40 years to regrow those uh, Forest back. Have you think about how that's going to affect your analysis? Yeah, so that's that's a really great question and something that we definitely talked about a lot, having a large impact. Um, I think the assumption in our study here is that uh, um, a sustainably managed forest is going to be riding that net 
line. And, um, and so we did just count the biogenic carbon as being embodied and sequestered uh, by those timber products. But that that's, that's something I would definitely like to look into more. And I think it would have a huge impact on the analysis. Definitely. Yeah. Great question. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for the question. It seems like uh, we need to move on to the um, next presenter. Thank you very much, Jonna. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. So uh, next presenter is Ben Salus. Uh, ben Salus is the is employed as a lab systems engineer at the, at Dort University in Sioux Center, Iowa. He is currently enrolled in the online systems engineering pro PhD program at Colorado State University with Dr. Jason Quinn as his advisor. Welcome, Ben. Go ahead. Thank you, Julie. Thank you. All right, there are my screens. All right, well, welcome everyone to my talk on uh, achieving optimal value of solar through municipal utility rate design. So just by way of basic outline, give a little bit of background, talk about value of solar, some of the methods being employed and some results, and then a look at the municipal rate analysis and then draw a few conclusions uh, from this work. So as just seen in the graphics that went by, although renewable energy on the US grid has been increasing over the last 30 years, the US is still considered in what would be called the large scale introductory phase. However, the EIA estimates that wind and solar are gonna triple in the next 30 years. And so uh, looking at how this impact will play out uh, becomes very important. Uh, two of the um, concerns with renewable energy are the intermittent generation and the grid stability. And there's been some large scale integration studies that have looked at both of these aspects. Uh, one was the Western Wind and Solar Integration Study, which was done in three phases. And another one is the Eastern Renewable Generation Integration Study. And these studies largely concluded that up to about 33% wind and solar can be largely accommodated in the existing grid infrastructure with some changes in the control adaptations to accommodate some of this intermittency and maintain the stability that we have become accustomed to. There are of course uh, considerable geographical variations across the country. So if we look here at the state of California, you can see that uh, wind is seven and solar is 15%, whereas a state like Iowa is 42% wind and very little uh, solar. Looking a little more broadly, um, at a region like the upper Midwest, which includes Iowa. Um, some studies have shown that a, a mix of wind and solar can be more beneficial as solar and wind uh, can actually complement each other in terms of the way their intermittency plays out. And so this study in particular, I'm looking at uh, Sioux Center located in Northwest Iowa using data from the local municipal utility in terms of demand and usage coupled with some real PV generation data from the solar lab on the roof of the science building at Dort University. Looking a little bit at some of the demand data, one of the chief concerns for the utility is the summer peak. And this is for a number of factors. One is that that's the highest capacity uh, that they need to meet throughout the year. It's also the time when the system is under the most stress. And finally, with the current demand charge structure, that peak value in the summer triggers the single highest cost for the utility throughout the, the year. Looking more closely at some of the actual peak times, the energy tends to peak at around 2.30 standard time or 3.30 daylight time uh, for um, more normal time tracking purposes. And it's elevated from hours 12 to 17 or about noon to 5 p.m. in the afternoon. You can see there's considerable variation from the minimum to the maximum, uh, as well as the average there. And we'll talk a little bit more on that variation a little, late, little later. Initially, one of the uh, thoughts of the study was, what can we do to address that peak specifically? And so using a, actually a west-south-west facing solar system, you can actually time that peak to match up very well with the summer peak in terms of demand. However, there is a price to pay for that, and that is a reduced total amount of kilowatt hours generated throughout the year, as well as a decreased production um, in winter months, uh, especially. So this kind of leads into the question, well, what is the, the most valuable? What is the most optimal? And this brought me into the value of solar methodology. So we'll talk a little bit about that methodology now. 
So the value of solar was initially established to calculate retail electricity rates, something that would be less than uh, net metering, but greater than simply the displaced fuel costs of conventional generation. And so as shown in the table here, there's five major categories that are being considered. The methodology considers both costs and benefits, but this table is intended to capture what would be the net benefit of the solar in these cases. The first one there, the generation capacity, looks at the ability of solar to avoid new generation costs um, by in terms of their output. Energy is the more straightforward one, just the avoided fuel and variable operation costs. Losses, there are some benefits from having uh, local distributed generation versus uh, transmitting power over long distances. Transmission and distribution capacity itself has both energy and capacity costs associated with it. And then finally, environmental, which can be considered very broad, anywhere from uh, air emissions and particulates to environmental health impacts and avoided water or land use. However, for this study, we're going to limit that to uh, the social cost of carbon or greenhouse gas emissions. One of the key tools in the value of solar is the load duration curve. So the way this curve is created is the five years of data are taken uh, in terms of their demand and then ordered from maximum to minimum. And so that's the demand here on the Y scale. And then you can plot then a relative duration from zero to one for each of that uh, demand. Then some power plant engineering techniques are uh, used to separate that into base, intermediate, and peak. And this is done with the 15, 60, and 100% uh, numbers. So the first key one here is at the 60% or 0.6 relative duration. You go up to the load uh, duration curve and then over, and then that sets a certain demand below which is considered the base demand. The second key is the 15%, so at 0.15 here, again, up to the low duration curve, over to the y-axis again, and now this is the trigger then for what's considered the peak, and then the intermediate is what falls in between the two. Uh, you'll notice on the curve that I actually have uh, four curves on here. The other three are what are called RLDCs or residual low duration curves. So the, the three that I have are for uh, four, 10 and 25% uh, PV penetration by energy. So that's total uh, kilowatt hours, which is uh, different than simply capacity. These numbers were chosen because 4% is the current wind fraction of energy for the local utility here. 25% uh, was the maximum value studied with the Western Wind and Solar Integration Study. And then 10% is a, a nice value in between the two where we start to see one of the uh, less desirable uh, impacts of overproduction. That leads me into the three uh, things that you tend to see with the RLDCs versus the general low duration curve. The first is, is uh, capacity credit. So there is a reduction in those highest uh, peak values or peak demand for the utility as a result of implementing the PV. The second two factors are less desirable. You some, see, uh, especially at higher penetrations, a reduced capacity factor in your base load. And this, depending on your base source, this may uh, be less desirable than in other cases. And then finally, with the very high penetration of solar energy, you can start to see overproduction at local times when you're generating more than your local demand. In terms of the assumptions made to calculate the costs and benefits, uh, I'm assuming that base and intermediate load is met with a, a conventional combined cycle steam generation, and the peak is met with a combustion turbine type of generation. Natural gas is assumed to be the fuel in both cases, which is considered a bit of a conservative estimate in terms of the overall cost benefits. The second key uh, tool in this study is uh, the optimization model. This is where I'm using the, the data that I mentioned briefly in the introduction. The first step is to take the TV data that I have from the solar lab and then run that through a calibration model. I'm using three of the tilts, 16, 41, and 65 degree tilt to calibrate the model, minimize that power error. And then I'm validating the, the model with the 29% or excuse me, 29 degree tilt data. These are chosen because 16 and 65 are the, the smallest and greatest tilt, and the 65 and 41 are the least and greatest in terms of total energy production. Then the goal is to then 
carry this error through the model so we can put some uncertainty on the results. The second uh, key data is the demand data, which is shown here. So this is then fed into an optimization strategy where the PV uh, generation is considered and then the tilt and the azimuth of the PV system is then des the design variable that's being optimized um, in this scheme. In this case here, we're trying to maximize the cost savings. So in the work I'm doing, I'm actually using the optimization strategy twice. The first is I'm looking specifically at value of solar as a methodology. So that is what's coming here out of the, the PV energy production. And so I want to maximize that. The second one is looking at net energy cost savings for a number of uh, rate structures for the utility and comparing how those uh, stack up in terms of what is optimal from a value of solar standpoint. As I mentioned, the error is quantified and propagated through the, the model. So we take the model standard deviation, do a Monte Carlo uh, analysis with that. Some results are shown here. And then take a look at the, the mean and standard deviation uh, versus nominal um, using 90% confidence interval error bars here. As you can see from 100 through 800 runs of the simulation, uh, we've achieved convergence of that simulation. And so we'll use these in the results to come. Now looking at some of the value of solar results. So the plot here is shown for uh, the 41S. That means I'm just taking our the data right from the PV array tilted at 41 degrees uh, facing south just to establish the, the baseline here. A few things that can be seen. One is that as we move from the, the low 4% uh, up to the high 25% PV energy, we're seeing a decrease in the value of solar. Looking at the constituent components, we can see that while the, the variable um, types, the fuel, variable operations and maintenance and the CO2, they stay relatively constant because they are proportional to that energy, uh, which is staying uh, about the same on the per kilowatt basis. Where we're seeing the reduction is in the capacity credit. So we see initially a much higher credit for that PV array than we see at the higher uh, energy penetrations. Can also put this plot in, on a uh, kilowatt hour basis. These numbers might be a little more intuitive. So you can see we're between seven and eight cents a kilowatt hour on the, the lower energy uh, penetration level and between five and six on the upper. Uh, you do have to be a little careful because as we're optimizing the solar array, we're actually changing the total number of kilowatt hours being generated. And so it really makes more sense to focus on the annual per kilowatt cost savings. So now I've just added the optimal values on there and you can see that indeed we're able to achieve uh, a greater savings. In particular, you'll notice that the lower values we're seeing a higher capacity credit over a typical just south facing system. And so we're able to achieve up to four to six percent higher value of solar, even though we're generating two percent, two to seven percent less total kilowatt hours from the system. Digging a little more deeply into the the residual low duration curves, we can see that we do see that reduction in total capacity as we increase the PV energy contribution. However, we are getting less of what's called the capacity credit. So where we're starting at upwards of sixty to seventy percent of capacity credit for that solar. When we get to the high levels of PV penetration, it falls to down more like 15%. We can also look at the reduced total energy. Um, this is um, nothing spectacular here. It just follows the four to 25% um, and total energy that we targeted with setting those values. Looking a little more deeply, we can look at how the capacities are breaking down between uh, peak, intermediate, and base. So you can see that while initially we see a decrease in all three capacities, as we start to increase the PV penetration, we see the peak and the intermediate capacities uh, actually start to rise again while the base capacity continues to fall. We can also look at that uh, base capacity factor that we mentioned, and we see that that falls um, particularly at the very high penetration levels. And again, as mentioned before, depending on the type of base energy being supplied, that may not be uh, desirable or less desirable in some situations versus others. 
Now we're gonna switch gears and look at the second optimization, which is the rate analysis. So some time of use and rate of use um, schemes were uh, looked as looked at as alternatives to the current demand and energy type of, of structure. So this looks at seeing how the base, intermediate, and peak capacities stack out in terms, this is all data of all five years in terms of the hour of day. And then we can start to look at impacts of things like just weekdays versus weekends, um, certain months, say May through October, or even specific months like July. And as you can see, as we delve down into those uh, areas, we see a higher uh, contribution of peak and uh, intermediate energy. So with some of that in mind, as well as consulting some uh, rate structures that are available online, two time of use structures were um, designed. The first is called a midday, where May th from May through October, seven to seven is considered a mid peak and on peak is from noon to six. And then an evening where there's just an on peak from three to 9 p.m. Uh, in the evening hours. So this would be TOU with a small M or TOUE with a small E. The second rate of use is just a done year round, year round and applied with the, the base and peak trigger uh, capacities as shown there from the low duration curve. Next part is this rate analysis to figure out what kind of premium to charge for these mid and peak uh, analyses. So this was done using uh, conventional generation levelized costs from the EIA overnight uh, build cost data. So comparing these, we can see that the intermediate is about 1.4 times the cost of base and the peak is an intermediate combined are about 2.1. And these values also fall very much in line with a couple other time of use uh, structures seen online as well. An important part of this analysis to ensure that we're starting from an equivalent revenue uh, standpoint. So as I mentioned, the, the current scheme for the utility is a demand energy structure. Here's that peak trigger in the summer months, which generates that highest cost and then a fixed energy cost throughout the year. So for each of the time of use and rate of use, a weighted energy matrix was compared or created multiplied by the usage and then equivalent rates were then calculated. So you can see the base rates fall between six and seven cents per kilowatt hours and the peak between 13 and 14. The evening just has a peak rate, the mid and base are the same for the analysis. So now we're gonna look at what are the results of the rate analysis compared to the value of solar. So these are actually the same value of solar results uh, shown earlier, except this is the resulting geometry. And you can see that there is definitely a change uh, from a south facing towards more west facing. So west would be 270 degrees, particularly for some of those lower uh, penetration values. I include the tilt here on the right, although it's rather uninteresting. It stays between the 30 and 38 uh, degrees for all the scenarios. So really it's the azimuth to focus on. So when we add the demand energy structure, you can see here that it actually uh, under predicts the uh, the azimuth for the very low. It agrees quite well for the, the regular low penetration, the 4%, and then um, has a sort of similar uh, tail off shape as the value of solar. The time of use uh, rate structures are interesting in that they stay largely flat. However, this does make sense when you consider that they really are focused on the time that the kilowatt hours are being generated. And so there's going to be an optimal sun position to generate the most hours in that time. And that's what we're seeing in those results. There is a bit of tail off in the high energy 25% uh, case as overproduction starts to be a factor. And then finally, the rate of use structure here actually starts as a south facing being optimal and then rises a little higher in terms of that azimuth angle. Now looking at the annual cost savings. So here is the, the VOS uh, annual cost savings, including the 90% confidence intervals. We add then the demand and energy. You can see that it tends to over predict uh, on the very low and then under predict on the high energy penetration, although it does follow a decreasing trend like the value of solar. The time of use energy rate structures are interesting in that they stay relatively flat as the energy level um, increases. And again, because they're really focused on just the time of the kilowatt energy is being generated and not so much considering those capacity effects. 
And then finally, the rate of use, it also follows a decreasing trend in terms of increasing PV penetration, although it tends to be higher than uh, value of solar and demand and energy in all cases. We can characterize the, the savings advantage over south using uh, differences here with those 90% confidence intervals. You can see that uh, with statistical certainty, 90% uh, at these low levels, we are seeing uh, an advantage over south, but that goes away as we start to get in less uh, capacity benefit uh, for those other systems. Then the final uh, result was to see, was to take these different rate structures and looking at the value of solar, it seemed from the azimuth and the cost savings that the demand energy structure seemed to be the best. And so wanted to take an attempt at tweaking that a little bit to see if we can make it agree better with the value of solar. So the um, sparing all the details, looked more closely at the actual peaks uh, of each month for all the scenarios and adjusted the weighting a little bit accordingly. And then also looked at how the um, energy um, and capacity or fixed versus um, variable costs and adjusted that from more like a 60-40 to a 40-60. A and so that's what I'm calling this, the uh, the weighted demand 40-60 split here. And you can see actually, it act, um, is largely the same as the demand and energy. If anything, it moves the azimuth a little further away from the value of solar. However, when we look at the annual cost savings, now we see some very good agreement, um, particularly on the low, medium, and high levels of PV penetration. At the marginal case there, it still tends to be uh, a little bit higher. Finally, just to uh, round things out, took the the azimuth geometry of the value of solar and ran it through this um, weighted rate structure here just to see what difference. And it's not a large difference, um, at least on this chart. You can hardly see it at all until we get to the, uh, the marginal case. So this seems to suggest that uh, smaller azimuth angles are not that sensitive in terms of the differences. It's really only on these larger differences where we see uh, that advantage really play out. So then just bringing this to a few conclusions, one I think demonstrated that value of solar can be an effective benchmark, both in designing uh, a PV system itself and to uh, analyze different electric rate structures. There is a, a south-southwest geometry advantage uh, for a solar system over a traditional south-facing system, uh, at least in uh, here in Northwest Iowa. And then finally, the demand and energy rate structure, although it is a more traditional rate structure does seem to be uh, one that is, is effective in following the trends of the value of solar. I want to just uh, give some acknowledgments to my advisor, Dr. Jason Quinn, and my committee members for their feedback into this work. Also to Sioux Center Municipal Utilities uh, for providing the data and working with me uh, on this project. Some references shown here, and with that, we will open it up to questions. Oh, thank you very much, Ben. Great presentation. Um, anybody has any questions, please either join the podium or type your questions if you like. Uh, I guess, well, everybody's getting ready. I, I have a question. So this is, uh, you know, the research is based in Iowa uh, in the United States. So what do you, uh, uh, you know, how it can be applied in the, in the either the methodology or results can be applied for different regions either in the U United States or in the rest of the world where it's like solar energy becomes abandoned? Yeah, so um, I didn't have, really have time to touch on it all, but one of the uh, things I'm going to do in, in my work is I'm actually going to repeat this analysis with PV Watts mm -hmm. um, because that's that that's a tool that's more widely available. I, I have seen some initially that there are some differences, so there are some advantages to having that real time correlation of the data. So, I, but I do want to quantify that because I I think that it's it's an excellent tool and and definitely a good start. Uh, so I want to kind of help quantify that in terms of the specific results that I've shown here. Yeah. Thank you very much. It's great. And then I swear to the audience, I didn't talk to Ben beforehand about this question. Uh, anybody else? Um, and uh, well, let, oh, I, I can have another question. Um, so I guess uh, uh, one of the application of this is to, uh, you said is to uh, help with the PV design. So can you give us like uh, some real life example or potential examples, like how we can be really helping us like in the future uh, for like a more 
rely on solar energy or either wind or solar energy, this is renewable energy. Uh, yeah, sure. I, I think the, the, the takeaway is that um, you, you can be smart about how the um, design the system in the first place. So, you know, and, and it's going to depend on your on on a lot of factors. But if you have, a, you know, a large flat space, if you can actually it might be advantageous to tilt that a little more uh, facing to the west, even though you're giving up some of the total kilowatt hours, which is is kind of a counterintuitive in some ways, um, but you're getting um, more kilowatt hours when you need them. So that's kind of the, you know, the one takeaway. And and I think it just, um, the idea was, is to show that there there is value here and then how that plays out, you know, if you're, and, and I think that's why it was initially developed saying that, you know, net metering is not really fair because not every kilowatt hour is the same. And so that's one of the things, you know, can we, can we have something that's a little smarter, more adaptive? Uh, to help kind of guide those decisions. Wonderful, excellent. Thank you for your answer, it's great. Um, all right, um, well, I guess uh, we can move on to our next um, presenter. If you have any question to Ben, you can uh, you know, type in the chat box and I'll, um, we can, we're gonna stay here and do, uh, at the end of the session. All right, our next presenter um, is Ming Cheng. Uh, Ren Mingcheng is a PhD candidate in Earth and Environmental Science at the National, uh, sorry, at the Natural Resources and Earth System Science PhD program at the University of New Hampshire. He has been working on modeling and assess assessing the life cycle, techno, economic, and environmental outcomes of solar PV battery systems and their integration into the centralized networks using complex system modeling approaches. Welcome, Ming Chen, and then I'll hand it to you. Thank you, Julie. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Ming Chen, like Julie said, and um, I'm a PhD candidate right now working with Dr. Weiwei Mo uh, in the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering uh, at the University of New Hampshire. So today, my presentation topic is um, spatial and temporal impact of residential solar PV systems adoptions. And today we also have Masume and Rusbag in the audiences. Maybe they can join us uh, for the Q&A session. So in today's presentation, I will start with the introduction, followed by the methodology development. After that, I will briefly share some preliminary results and discussions we, are, uh, we get in the past months, as well as um, last but not the least, I will talk about our um, our ongoing and future work. So there is an increasing trend of policy support for the res residential PV battery adoption on both federal and state levels in the US. So the recent FERC order um, 2222 is the first federal level policy that enables the distributed PV batteries to participate in the regional organized wholesale markets through the PV aggregations. So following this, the EIA also reported that solar energy will account for the largest share of new US electricity generating capacity in 2020, which um, uh, this amount will be around 15.4 gigawatts, uh, accounts for 39% of um, over the new or overall new imagined capacity. So despite the technology's increasing popularity, um, our, our, our understanding of the spatial and temporal impacts of different PV battery adoption schemes, considering the interactions between the solar PV battery systems and the grid. Um, so for example, the unplanned large penetration of residential solar PV systems might result in a steeper ramp up in the grid after um, after sun begins to set and um, and the use rises, which this will make more difficult for the grid operators to accommodate, just like the last presentation Ben um, presented. So there are also a lot of limitations in understanding the impacts of PV battery adoption while considering the comprehensive spatial and temporal distribution of economic and environmental benefits as well as the feedback loop and the feedback interactions between the distributed energy systems, as well as the centralized 
uh, energy network due to the penetration of solar generation. So for instance, the increasing participation of distributed solar energy could also gradually change the electricity wholesale price scheme. And hence, um, they will impose um, financial impacts on the wholesale um, power generators. And as a feedback, and this will order the economic costs and benefits um, of the PV hosts when they are engaged or when they're participated in the wholesale markets. So in order to address these knowledge gaps, our research overarching objective um, is to investigate the technical, environmental and economic impact of PV battery adoption while capturing the spatial and temporal distribution and trade-off of grid performances as well as economic and environmental benefits. So here on the screen uh, presents you the modeling framework we're using in this study. So basically there are um, two major sector. Um, let me, one moment using the laser. Yeah, so there are major two sector, including the PV battery adoption sec um, section and the impact section. So um, in the PV adoption, PV battery adoption section, they have three sub models, includes the PV battery system simulation to determine the power generation through the distributed energy PV system. And then um, is the dual and demand simulation. And after that, we're trying to match the power generation with the power demand and then scale up from this bottom uh, individual level system into a regional level through our adoption simulation. After that, the output of the PV battery adoption will import it into the impact section where we look into the technical, environmental, and economic impacts um, on both PV hosts, individual users, as well as the electric uh, network operators. So um, our previous studies has already developed um, our PV battery system simulation. So to begin with, um, I would like to briefly introduce how we build up um, the first submodels, as well as what kind of technical and environmental indicators we are using um, in our modeling framework. So here presents you the framework uh, within that PV battery adoption, um, PV battery sim um, system simulation. So basically, in um, in this model. We consider the life cycle stages of manufacturing and transportation, as well as the use phases of PV system. And we use system dynamics modeling uh, integrated with the life cycle assessment to um, simulate um, the technical performances of PV system. So this shows you our um, brief system dynamics modeling we're using uh, during the operational phase simulation. So the solar energy power generation simulation considers the dynamic data input from the Unreal database, including the in, um, incident solar radiation, ambient temperature, as well as wind speed, um, to uh, generate a 30 minutes time step um, solar energy generation. And after that, the generated energy will be um, used to meet your solar, uh, directly used to meet your demand, or they can, um, uh, charge your battery. And if there's a more surplus, this part of solar energy will be sold to the grid. And uh, when the energy um, goes into the um, battery storage, and then we also simulate how the energy uh, has been used at different, different time steps. So the overall simulation has been um, conducted for 20 years uh, within a life cycle. And after that, we select our um, collect the data output, and then we estimate the life cycle uh, cost um, for our typical PV systems, as well as estimating the um, carbon water and fossil fuel footprints, um, considering the above mentioned stages. And uh, for the details of the equations or the details uh, regarding calculating the carbon and water footprint, as well as life cycle cost, uh, we um, won't take too much time talking about today. And you're welcome to find those details in my um, in our previous published papers. Well, once we generated the solar PV system, we would like to overcome the difficulties that in our previous studies, we use our predefined 
or predefined real data from the Department of Energy, which they provided a prototype house demand. We would like to overcome the difficulties uh, of data selection um, for the real data, as well as um, give some flexibility to test different adoption scenarios. We're trying to simulate the dwelling's um, demand, uh, considering the major five sectors. So in this section, I will briefly talk about um, how we simulate the dwelling um, demand. So we majorly consider five um, counterparts, including the high vac, lightning, power-related activities, cold appliances, and fixed use. So to begin with, I would like to introduce about the high vac modeling. So in order um, to estimate the energy, the electricity use of high vac system, we applied a thermodynamic evolution of air model um, to be able to capture the heat transfer as well as the temperature changes of the house uh, among three agents, including um, the residential house, the high vac system, as well as the environment. So here shows you a brief example when we use system dynamics modeling. So we consider the inflow of, of the heat inflow to the house, as well as the heat outflow, as well as within that house, how the heat has been um, uh, um, maintained, as well as how it affects the temperature fluctuations. So on the screen shows you the guiding equation we're using for um, estimating the room, uh, inside room temperature. Basically, um, this inside room temperature are dominating by the factors, for example, the mass um, of air inside the house, as well as the temperature of the high vac supply into the room, as well as the current time step room temperature, as well as the um, uh, air mass flow through the high vac system. Um, and also another in indicator is the thermal resistance of the house um, to be able to simulate the inside room uh, temperatures um, within, out, uh, within each time step. So after we uh, get the dynamic inside room temperature, we are uh, able to further translate that into our high vac energy consumption patterns. So basically these are the two examples of guiding equations we are used to estimate it um, the heating energy consumption and the cooling en energy consumption. So majorly the dominating factors includes um, the air mass flow rate, which is the high vac capacity, um, as well as the temperature differences between the high vac air supplies, as well as the current um, room temperature. And the other indicators is the coefficient of the performances when you're choosing different technologies for heating or for cooling uh, in this equation. Then we'll be able to monitoring the room, inside room temperature and the match with the energy consumption during each time step to be able to generate it, um, the, the ideal uh, electricity patterns of the high vac. <clears throat> So the last, um, the, the coming part is the um, remodeling the cold appliances. So in order to um, simulate the um, cold appliances, we are using a Bernoulli distribution approach to uh, simulating the um, energy use uh, for the cold appliances. And we assume that the cold appliances was evenly distributed over one year. And we use uh, average nominal power ratings of a refrigerator collected from the American uh, Appliances Stock Report. And then we collected from the EIA to estimate what is the overall uh, annual electricity consumed by refrigerator in the US homes. And then we use the overall annual uh, amount in kilowatt hour divided by the nominal power ratings to be able to understand what is the duration, the length, when we're running uh, our refrigerator at the nominal power ratings to be able uh, to consume the um, electricity energy. So uh, this roughly estimation provide us our, um, in our simulation that we run the cold appliances running for three random 10 minutes intervals for every five hours. So on the right, um, you can see the graph we're using um, 
uh, after our simulation that these cold appliances energy consumption uh, will started to jump out um, during the um, every five hours for three 10 minutes intervals within a 24 hours. And the next step is we are trying also to simulate the uh, a large portion of electricity demand that is the power related activities. So for um, for this section, uh, so for all, all other um, uh, energy consumption activities, we are trying to identify nine major human activity types. So they're including the sleeping, non-power activity, cleaning, laundry, cooking, dishwashing, leisure, away working, away not working. We are also trying to consider five major occupant types, including the working, non-working males um, and females, as well as the children. So in order to simulate the activity patterns of different types of occupants, so we are using the Markov chain model. So the Markov chain model is a statistic model which describes our sequence of possible events um, using the transition probability matrix as shown in this figure. For example, the probability of transition from sleeping to sleeping at this time step is um, 95% while transit, uh, transit from sleeping to laundry shows 1.5% at this current time step. So for the purpose of simulating power related activities, we have we collect the, the uh, ATUS data. Um, so the ATUS data represents the American Times uh, US survey conducted by the US Bureau of Labor Statistics. So these surveys, the measures the amount of time people spend doing various activities. So in order to um, represent people's behavior uh, on an hour to hour and day to day basis, so we use a probability matrix uh, as shown uh, in this equation. So as time proceeds from uh, T to T plus one and a state um, transition occurs. So these transition are governed by this transition probability a P. So this um, transition probability differentiated uh, by weekday and weekends, as well as for each hour of a day, uh, which represented by the H. And um, we also differentiated by different type of occupants um, um, in, in, in this equation. And after uh, when uh, after we determine the transition probability, and then we are able to observe from the raw data and estimate the number of transitions um, at one minute intervals. Um, and then 31 minute observations, we'll use that to further uh, count it um, for each type of occupants for 30 minutes. So during each time step, we are trying to identify what will be the activity coming next. So how to do this? We are trying to generate a random number and compare with the cumulative distribution of the state transition to determine which transition takes place next. So as showing in this figure, because the random number right now showing the figure is in the second interval, so which indicates that these occupants will transit into the second activity. So after um, we organize those uh, raw data, we will be able to obtain the nine times nine um, transition probability matrix for 10 types of occupants, considering the weekday and weekends, sorry, for five types of occupants, consider both weekend and weekdays. After generating the activity sequence, and we would like to convert the activity patterns into our power demands. So using the power conversion factors we will obtain from the American appliances stock. And therefore we will be able to generate um, the active uh, power related human behavior energy consumption patterns. So uh, the coming part is the lightning and the fixed use. The lightning and the fixed demand was um, uh, also determined for the lightning consumption the daytime and nighttime lightning consumption factors was used. So the daily sunset and sunrise time of our study case was considered to determine the time and uh, the day and night uh, time boundaries. So our, our, our study also assumed that the lightning consumption was 
uh, estimated only when at least one occupant is at home. So the fixed demand represents the uh, energy consumption, including the standby uh, computer, the standby appliances. Uh, in order to simulate that, we use a fixed uh, constant electricity cons uh, consumption factor to represent that. And we assume this part of energy um, um, is consumed 24 seven. So once we get the um, dwelling simulation, we're trying to scale up from um, uh, building level as well as a household personal level into a regional level. So in order to do that, um, we're trying to simulate the patterns um, uh, on a regional basis. So before we do that, we identify the types of household in our, uh, in our study area. Um, so these eight types of household types um, is determined following the suggestion from 2010 US Census Survey, which includes the single male, single female, um, husband, wife, family with one child, husband, uh, wife, family without child, um, single male family with one children, uh, one child, and single female family with one child, and two male household and two female household. So the approach we identify that is um, the first of all we are, we uh, obtain the percentages of various household type uh, based upon the 2010 U.S. Census data, and then um, we are able to identify the number of household in um, a U.S. Census block group. Uh, therefore, we can estimate how many type of households in that certain parcels, and then we identify the household units in each building. We randomly assign the household type into each household unit um, with the consideration of the percentage of household type to be able to scale up. And one thing we I would like to also add on here is we also identify the high vac. Uh, types for each type of household following the suggestion and the data report from the EIA. For example, uh, one in third, um, uh, one in six of the um, Massachusetts, for example, uh, household, they use electric resistor, um, while the others, they may not, uh, they may use natural gas uh, approaches for heating. And we also use the random assign function to further determine the appliances type for each household unit. And um, the last part I, uh, in the methodology I'd like to address is the economic impacts. While we will we are highlight this section because we investigated the feedback loop between um, among the PV adoption as well as the wholesale electricity market. We assume the penetration of PV battery system, uh, the PV solar energy into the wholesale markets will fluctuate the wholesale electricity prices, which will change the um, price scheme and we are we interesting to see how the prices will be changes both geographically um, as well as temporally. So in order um, to do that, um, uh, we are the wholesale we're trying to um, provide an empirical equation to be able to investigate the impacts of PV on the wholesale electricity prices. So for here we um, use the historical minute remix data as well as the daily generation by fuel type data and hourly wholesale low cost data, prices of fuels as well as the revenue of each type of uh, fuels for power generation. And then we import it uh, using uh, the JMP linear regression methods and then test it through AIC criteria both uh, in both forward and backwards directions. And then we are able to generate the um, empirical equation that um, the wholesale electricity prices in the ISO New England England area are majorly dominating by the prices of, um, of wind and oil as well as the natural gas prices uh, as well as their usage. We assume the increasing of PV adoption at a regional level will replace um, the major dominator, which is the natural gas, and to see how the wholesale prices fluctuates over time. And for the um, for better demonstrate some preliminary result we have, uh, I would like to use the city of Boston uh, as our test bed. So the information of the residential buildings are uh, selected and analyzed. Um, uh, so we're collecting those part of data from the city of Boston's open source uh, GIS data portal. And the key attributes in these data sets, including the building type, the street name and number, 
um, the living area, the number of floors, as well as the um, the number of bedrooms. And then we'll further use those uh, building envelopes um, to optimize our high back system, as well as the estimated the electricity demand for um, other four um, consumption uh, uh, sections. And so there are total around 68,000 residential buildings are investigated in this case. Um, I would like to show you some uh, results uh, when we imported these 68,000 buildings um, through the PV adoption model output. So these figures on the screen presents, um, presents you under 100% PV adoption in the city of Boston, how the, um, um, in, in our case study. So um, our results from there are more than 90% of buildings could generate in around between 2000 to 8000 kilowatt hour annually um, to either meet the local demands or sell to the grid through the adoption of grid connected PV system. While geographically, we see that the buildings with higher solar potential clusters cluster in the southwest of the city area and are usually located far from the downtown area and these buildings are mostly identified as single family household uh, which they have a larger available rooftop area um, compared with the multi-family homes which are dominating in near the downtown area um, of the city of boston and in addition we also um, output and estimate the average potential rated capacity for each investigated buildings. So we found um, the average rated capacity is 3.7 kilowatt, so which is 0.74 times as large as the average size of a residential PV system in the US. So in the US it's around five kilowatt, uh, kilowatt which means more than 85.3% um, of those buildings are below the US average um, to install a potential PV system um, which smaller than five kilowatt hour, uh, five kilowatt, and we also find um, around ninety nine point eight percent of those potential PV uh, installations were smaller than ten kilowatt, and which indicates only less than zero point two percent of those buildings may not be available to access to the unlimited net metering due to the current utility policy of Massachusetts. And one other interesting discussion or takeaways we found is, according to the Massachusetts Commonwealth Solar Program, they set a statewide target of installing 1,600 megawatt of solar PV by 2020, um, which 160 megawatt targets has been set to the city of Boston uh, based upon the uh, proportional estimation of the city population over the state population. We found that the potential rated capacity from the residential uh, PV adoption path can achieve 254.7 megawatt hour, which, um, which implies encouraging residential PV adoption um, could um, met this targeted um, in if we further um, implement policy to encourage residential PV adoption. And this um, figure shows the grid load reduction uh, under 100% adoption condition in the city of Boston. So temporarily we found that the solar energy generation peaks um, between the May and July. So hence a large amount of solar energy can be sold uh, or stored during these bounds. Furthermore, we also identify the grid demand um, of the ISO New England is the highest during the summer month um, based upon the ISO New England report as well as national uh, EIA report. So the utilities often use natural gas um, in ISO New England 70.5% and hydro and nuclear generation to meet the additional seasonal demand um, based upon the 2018 ISO New England report. While this may imply in installation of a, P, a grid connected PV system may alleviate our local um, energy, energy stress and replace fuels that has a higher um, carbon emission factors during each time. Um, and I would also like to show you some quick results uh, we obtained um, from the demand uh, submodels. Uh, due to the time reasons for here, I will just show you our we are using a high vac model into our um, peak, uh, re peak typical residential houses, where we found using the our high vac model can maintain the inside room temperature in a comfort zone for this uh, household. 
And then um, we compare the scenario using electric resistor as well as using heat pumps for this typical house. And then it provides uh, four times larger com um, using electric resistor compared with the heat pumps and averagely produced using around 30 kilowatt hour, uh, which in the range um, um, through the literature review um, compare uh, through the literature review that people using electric resistor for residential heating purposes um, um, within a day for our same size typical household. And a later part, we are trying to also testing our um, activity behavior models through uh, pick up random person days. As shown in this graph, they show five um, type of occupants doing both weekend uh, as well as weekdays, show both in firm and dotted line. And we find out our um, Markov chain simulated uh, model uh, provide an ideal result through comparing the percentage of people uh, doing activity um, from the real ATUS data compared with the simulated data. And we believe this could be a good start to further scale up our demand model and then match up with our power generation model. So our continuous work, we will still con uh, trying to connecting our PV battery system model with the dwelling uh, demand simulation model on a regional scale, as well as testing different various PV battery adoption scenarios. Uh, we are also trying to validating our model outputs on a, a larger scale, and as well as um, plotting the wholesale electricity prices changes uh, on the various adoption scenarios, and furthermore investigating the technical, economic, environmental trade-offs um, on the various adoption scenarios. So we are hoping our work can further provide indispensable insights into the planning as well as the management uh, of residential PV battery systems to inform the regional policy making, considering um, uh, the interaction of the PV adoption as well as its impacts on the wholesale electricity market. Um, last but not least, um, I, this work cannot be done with the help from um, both Dr. Um, Patrick as well as Dr. Mitchell and Dr. Motaro, uh, Muratori, sorry. And um, we would like also to uh, um, acknowledge um, the Research Computing Center of UNH as well as our research group um, not but not the least uh, is our NSF to provide valuable funding for to support this research. Um, and I'm now welcome you uh, to bring any suggestions or comments or any questions. And thank you. Thank you very much, Ming Chen. Great presentation. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, and we are accepting questions from the audience right now. I see thousands of me. Um, well, Ming Chen, I, I have a, a not like really a question, but a more like curiosity um, because uh, some of these companies and because of the pandemic, apparently uh, some of the companies announced this work from home model. So I guess um, more and more people hope maybe it's going to, you know, start to work from home. And then have you, you know, I, I, I'm, well, I, I don't think it's reasonable for to consider this like for a three years research, but uh, I, what's your envisioning um, you know, the, the change of the results or maybe in the future, what's going to change if people, more people start to work from home? Mm -hmm. Thank you for that question. Actually, that's a really timing and a nice question. Yeah, so actually we thought about this question before. Previously, we were thinking about designing a scenario comparison through if people all stay at home, through using more weekend patterns uh, to replace the weekday patterns to be able to see how the difference is. But I assume based upon our preliminary um, uh, act, a power related activity simulation, we see that usually during the uh, weekends, they will have, um, I would say during the weekends, they will usually have a higher uh, electricity consumption. So we assume that this may further, um, um, how should I say, uh, change the um, residential demand patterns. And we're hoping and um, wondering to see how the PV can support this increasing demand. Uh, we assume that this will kind of decrease the interaction between the decentralized PV system as well as with the grid um, due to the more people would like to use locally energy when they stay at home. And we are hope probably will be an interesting 
um, it would be very insightful to get results and provide suggestion to the uh, utilities company to see how this will change over time. Yeah, how, how this um, temporarily gonna change the uh, local grids. Yeah. Right. Exactly. And then, you know, it's not only the uh, single uh, unit house, um, the demand from single unit house, it's also the decrease of demand from these office buildings. Mm -hmm. if the, uh, there's some incentive to the utility sectors. Mm -hmm. yeah. great, answer. Great, great answer. Thank you very much. Thank Any you. more questions from the audience? Well, people are hungry, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> I assume. In a time, well, in, on the East Coast. Um, all right, I guess last chance, anybody? Well, if uh, nobody's asking more questions, uh, we're going to end this session. And then I thank all three presenters for their wonderful presentations and, and, and the answers to the questions. And uh, I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Julie.